Hello, this is Domenico with Easynomics, and this is the fourth part of uh, a video where we are breaking down a paper two type question, which is useful because the examples within the text of a paper two can be used as a real world example in paper one, part B. And also this video and paper twos are useful in helping us understand how to break down articles for internal assessments. In those previous videos, and there's links in the video notes below, uh, to these articles. Those articles highlighted the global food crisis caused by the Russian-Ukrainian war, leading to disruptions, in this case, of wheat into the global market. Uh, we have another article highlighting this and its impact on a particular nation, Egypt. And we also have another article concerning the Middle East and North Africa regarding potential wheat and food shortages that could lead to uh, riots, famine, mass migration, and so on. In this article, uh, it provides a uh, it provides st data on wheat prices over time, and in this video, we're going to use a perfectly competitive market structure to illustrate uh, why the price of wheat has gone from two hundred eighty nine dollars per ton to. $523 per ton and why it's likely to collapse. And we can see that the volatility of commodity prices is relatively extreme in some cases, that it could lead to dramatic increases and falls. And a perfectly competitive market structure model helps us understand this along with an understanding of elasticity. In those previous three videos, which I'll have linked here, we understood why the demand curve for commodities such as wheat have a very inelastic demand curve with a direct relationship between price and total revenue, why the supply curve is also very inelastic, and how a reduction in supply leads to a, a, a greater change in price than a change in quantity. So you can review those um, videos if you would like, which will be linked. Okay. So let's go ahead and start uh, tackling this question. So again, paper two, I used text uh, snippets from those articles, and we're going to be using text A to answer the, pa the paper two question. In text A, we can see that uh, the war in Ukraine has led to um, reductions in the global supply of grain because Russia and Ukraine together account for about 30% of the world's global wheat exports. So they combined have a significant impact on the global supply of wheat. It also states that 20% of corn into the global market comes from Russia and Ukraine, and 80% of the sunflower oil also uh, emanates from Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it goes on to explain that um, 95% of Ukraine's total grain is shipped out through the Black Sea, but because of the war, that conduit was shut down. It's now recently been opened, um, and Russia is the number one exporter of wheat. So we can use this information for our, uh, for our model. And the question we're going to be highlighting or going over is we've done Part B, I and, I, I and double I. We've done C in the last uh, video. Now we're going to tackle this question D. And then I'll be in the habit of highlighting some key things uh, so I know what to do on this question. So I'm going to be using a perfectly competitive model. There's a little side note here, which includes the industry and the firm, to explain what's happening in the short run and in the long run uh, to global supply and wheat prices as a result of the Russo Ukrainian war. And in text A, paragraphs one, two, and three, it highlights that the global supply has been reduced. So let's graph this. So perfect competition has two models, two graphs side by side. Graph D illustrates the industry, which in this case is the global wheat market, the total supply and demand for wheat in the world market. And graph E is looking at one particular firm or one individual wheat farmer. In graph D, we'll be measuring quantity and price. In graph E, I'll be measuring quantity and price, costs, and revenue. You can also label the y-axis for graph, graph D, price, cost, and revenue. But I'll keep it simple and just have it labeled 
um, price. We learned in the previous videos that the supply curve of commodities like wheat are relatively inelastic, which means that they're relatively vertical. In this case, perhaps because of length of time, the time it takes to grow wheat, so it's not very responsive to a change in price. And we're going to label this that S1 is equal to the marginal costs of production. Then I'm going to have my downward sloping inelastic demand curve. Oh, I've drawn that, I drew that relatively straight, but I'm a little bit of perfectionist, so I'll keep that also relatively straight. And uh, D1 is equal to the marginal benefit. Since food, like wheat, is a necessity, has a relatively inelastic demand curve, and I'll, I'll illustrate the equilibrium. So here we have an equilibrium price and an equilibrium quantity. This will be labeled P1, price at P1, and quantity at Q1. And I'll go ahead and label this as point A. Then I'm going to draw this line further across. So we'll have that line come further across to become the perfectly elastic price that an individual wheat farmer must accept since they are a price taker. They have no control over price. I'm just going to highlight kind of a dotted line highlighting that this price goes on or the industry sets the price that all farmers must accept. And again, I'll label this as P1, price at P1. And here again, it's price at P1, which is equal to our demand curve, which is equal to our average revenue curve, which is equal to our marginal revenue curve. And I can also state that demand is equal to our marginal benefit. Oops, I don't want to confuse that with this demand curve. So I'll, uh, I'll call this, uh, well, we'll just say graphy uh, D1, AR1, MR1, and MB1. Whereas graph D, this is D1. So what's missing? I got to draw my supply curve for the individual farmer. And that has a kind of backwards J shape. You've learned in theory of the firm that the supply curve has this sort of shape. The law of diminishing marginal returns takes place here. And that from that point on, the marginal cost of production is increasing, in this case, for the individual farmer. So here we have uh, S1 for the individual farmer again, equal to their marginal costs of production. And this particular point, it's going to be useful for me to mark where the average total cost curve is. This is going to be the lowest point for the ATC curve. All right, and there we have our average total cost curve. And this point here marks minimum average total cost, which by definition is productive efficiency. So here I'll have my price set by the individual farmer at Q1, Q2. I'll label this, uh, let's say, we'll call this Q3. Okay, or maybe Q1, just to keep it simple. Less confusing as well. Okay. Um, some notes here. So before we begin, this is our starting point. Whenever we draw perfect competition, this is the first thing that we draw in all cases. And we're going to notice that with the industry, we have the supply curve, which is equal to the demand curve, which sets an equilibrium price at P1 and Q1. We know that at Q1, the quantity supplied is equal to the quantity demanded. And we also can see that the at S1 equals D1, that the marginal cost is equal to the marginal benefit. So the industry is allocatively efficient. With the individual firm, we're going to assume profit, maximiz uh, profit, maximiz <laughs> profit maximization. That's going to be the objective of the firm, the goal. That's the assumption. The objective of the firm is to maximize profit. 
And the rule for profit maximization is to produce where MR equals MC. And I have a video that explains why. Okay, so we see that where MR equals MC, here's my MR curve, here's my MC curve, and that occurs at this point. So AB, perhaps I'll call this point C. At point C, profit maximization is achieved. We also see that it provides quantity at Q1, and we see that at Q1, the firm is producing at minimum average total cost. So it is productively efficient. Okay, and we also see that the marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost. So also here we see MB is equal to MC, so it's allocatively efficient. These are some background, background notes all right, that you should be aware of, which will help you with your evaluation. Okay, so let's go ahead and illustrate what's happening with the Russo-Ukrainian war. Well, the article highlights the war has disrupted the global supply, so there's less wheat being provided or exported by Russia and Ukraine, so the global supply curve would be shifting inwards. So let's illustrate that. So here it goes from S1 to S2, inelastic supply curve, S2 equals my marginal costs of production, that's a supply shock, shifts in, it sets a new equilibrium here at point B, which will establish a higher price in the world market and a reduced quantity. So here we see price rising from P1 to P2 due to the shortage and the quantity supplied and demand in the world market decreasing from Q1 to Q2. So price is rising and quantity supply and demand is decreasing. That becomes the price that the firm must accept. So I'm gonna have to take that price and draw it all the way across for the firm. Okay, and again, I'll have dotted lines. They're saying that perfectly elastic price that every farmer worldwide must accept since they don't control the world price. That will be P2, okay, which is equal to my average uh, revenue. And if the firm wants to maximize profit, so profit max is achieved where MR equals MC. So that's going to incentivize the individual farmer to increase their production along their supply curve. They're going to employ more land, labor, and capital resources until MR equals MC. So here's my MC curve. This is now P2, which again is equal to my demand curve, which is equal to my average revenue, which is equal to my marginal revenue, which is equal to my marginal benefit. So here's MR, and it connects with MC at this point, point D. So the farmer is increasing their production along their supply curve. They're motivated by that higher price. They see that there's greater profits that can be achieved if they increase their output. So that increases the quantity of output from Q1 to Q2. So here we have increased quantity supplied the farmer employing more resources, land, labor, and capital resources. Now we have to highlight the profit that's being generated, the abnormal profit. At this point, we can see, and I'll make a little note, that price at P2, price at P2 is equal to my average revenue. What about my average total costs? My average total costs are right here at this point. So costs on, uh, on average are right here. So I'll label this, let's say, just we'll call this C1 or ATC1, let's say, for example. And then I'm going to highlight this to highlight the supernormal profit that's being generated. And I, then I'm basically almost done drawing this. So this highlighted area here is the supernormal profit 
that the individual farmer is making. At Q2 now, at Q2, we see that the average revenue is greater than the average total cost. So the individual farmer is generating super normal profit. What's going to happen here is once farmers worldwide, perhaps they're producing uh, rice, let's just say as an example, and they say they see that uh, wheat is where you can generate even greater profit, they'll switch away from rice towards wheat production, right? Just as an example. As farmers worldwide switch away from whatever they're producing towards wheat production to get to grab some of the supernova profit, that's going to eventually mean that in the long run, the supply should be increasing. The global supply is more and more farmers switch towards wheat production. The global supply should be increasing, which will bring the price back down, which will lead to, since all these farmers are producing an increase in the quantity and bring all farmers back to what we call normal profit. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and analyze this as we would for an exam with some notes. And again, if we look at the real world, Prices, that could be, you know, helping us understand why price rises and falls. Here in 2008, price of wheat increased dramatically, but then it collapsed because that higher price attracts more farmers towards wheat production. And as they collectively produce more, the global supply increases and the price falls. And so with the Russian-Ukrainian war, we would expect that the higher price will incentivize more farmers to switch towards wheat production to grab that supernova profit, which would lead to its collapse. Now, the price of wheat has fallen for um, other reasons uh, due to Turkey mediating an agreement between Russia and Ukraine. Now there's wheat coming out of the Black Sea from Ukraine that's increasing the global supply. But generally speaking, in economics, uh, in this theoretical model, we would say that higher prices uh, leads to eventually increased global supply since farmers in this case will switch towards it. So here is the analysis. As can be seen, we have two graphs, graph D illustrating the industry or the global wheat market, graph E illustrating the individual firm or wheat farmers. On the Y axis, we're measuring price. On the X axis, we're measuring quantity for graph D and in graph E, we're measuring price, cost, revenue on the y-axis and quantity on the x-axis. In graph D, we have two upward sloping supply curves according to the law of supply, labeled S1, S2, equal to the marginal cost of production, and a downward sloping demand curve labeled D1. It should be noted that since wheat is a primary commodity, the price elasticity of supply is inelastic, has a value less than one, and the price elasticity of demand also has a value less than one. We see that where S1 equals D1, or uh, where MC, MC equals MB, which highlights that it is allocatively efficient, it provides an equilibrium price at P1 and equilibrium quantity at Q1. That becomes the perfectly elastic price that the individual farmer must accept. And in graph E, we see that we also have an upward sloping supply curve labeled S1 equal to our marginal cost of production. And we see that where S1 equals ATC, this occurs where ATC is at minimum. And minimum ATC highlights productive efficiency at point C. Assuming that the objective of the firm is to profit maximize, they'll produce where the marginal revenue curve equals the marginal cost curve at point C. And at point C, we see that there's a quantity established at Q1, and at Q1 that the average revenue is equal to the average total cost, which highlights that the firm is generating normal profit. Should also be noted that the perfectly elastic price that the firm accepts is equal to our demand curve, equal to the average revenue curve, equal to the MR curve, equal to the marginal benefit curve. The individual farmer is productively efficient and also allocatively efficient. The Russian-Ukrainian war leads to a supply shock, a reduced supply of wheat into the global market. So it shifts in from S1 to S2. It leads to a, dramatically, uh, a dramatic increase in price from P1 to P2 and a slight reduction in quantity 
from Q1 to Q2. We see that the percent change in price is greater than the percent change in quantity due to the inelasticity of the supply and demand curves. At point B, where S2 equals D1 and new equilibrium price is established at P2, that becomes the perfectly elastic price that the individual farmer must accept, where P2 is equal to D2, equal to AR2, equal to MR2, equal to MB2. And the farmer incentivized by the higher price will increase their quantity of supply from point C to point D or from Q1 to Q2. And we notice that at Q2, the average revenue is greater than the average total cost. So the firm is generating super normal profit or abnormal profit in the short run. In addition, we see that at Q2, at Q2, ATC is greater than minimum ATC. We see that this point is higher than this point. So the firm is becoming productively inefficient. The supernormal profit that is the shaded area attracts competition, attracts more farmers into wheat production. They switch away from whatever they're producing towards wheat production and collectively in the long run that will increase the global supply of wheat. Thus global supply of wheat should increase and move in graph D from S2 to S1, reestablishing an equilibrium at point A causing the global price to fall from P1 to P, from P2 to P1 and the quantity supply and demand to increase from Q2 to Q1. That will become the price that the individual farmers must accept. And as the price falls, individual farmers to minimize their losses, oops, will reduce their quantity supplied from D to C. And at point C, they will stop where they're generating normal profit, where AR is greater than AR is equal to ATC, and we're at point C, they're producing at minimum ATC, so it's productively efficient. And also uh, with the individual firm, they're allocatively efficient because at point C, marginal benefit equals the marginal cost. So that's just a, uh, an overview of the analysis. I'll provide in the notes below an outline of that analysis. And I also have another video that explains this, but here you have a real world example to highlight how the russian ukraine war led to supply shock but in the long run how the price should eventually fall as the higher price attracts more firms or farmers into the global market to produce okay if you have any questions feel free to comment uh, those questions and don't forget to subscribe and to like thank you so much